Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Soil Carbon for Your Farm Business, Farmers Trading Carbon, brought to you as part of the Central West Local Land Services ADAPT project. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Today, we welcome Mike Rosser, who runs a family farming operation based in Central West New South Wales, and Stuart Austin, the General Manager at Millmont Cattle Company in the New England. Before we get into the webinar, let me introduce myself and run through some housekeeping. I'm Rowan Leach, the Regional Ag Land Care Facilitator with Central West Local Land Services, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Again, we've had a wonderful response from you, the audience, with many from webinar one asking for some practical, practical examples of carbon sequestration and trading. Today's presenters will provide that insight for you. Assisting me today is Nerily Brennan, the team leader of Ag Services in Central West Local Land Services. If you need help with anything throughout the webinar, please contact Nerily, whose number is on the bottom of the screen. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see this control panel, which allows you to actively participate in today's webinar. You can use the orange arrow button to collapse and expand this con uh, control panel during the presentation. In the handouts tab, you'll see PDF copies of today's slideshows for you to download and view later. After some technical issues in the last webinar, if at any stage you cannot see the presentation, please let us know and we'll try to rectify any problems. All participants are currently muted and this webinar will be recorded today and made available to everyone who has registered. Feel free to submit a written question or comment at any time as there'll be question time at the end of each of today's presentations. Before I hand over to our first presenter, we just have a quick poll for you to fill out. This will help our presenters to know a bit more about our audience and what sort of businesses have joined us today. So just give me a few seconds while I launch the poll. Uh, can we all see that? Yeah, so we've got some responses coming in now. Uh, yeah, it looks like, uh, so we've got cattle as our main enterprise, sheep, cropping, mixed farming and other. Um, if you're in the other column, uh, maybe put in the chat box what, uh, what your main enterprise is. That'd be really interesting for us. So we've got the majority of voted. We'll just go for three more seconds. Three, two, one. Thanks very much. And I'll just share those results for, for Mike and Stu. So we've got a, a dead heat between cattle and mixed farming as our main enterprises, um, with a couple from uh, the other and, and sheep as a, as a close second. So we'll, um, we'll keep going. So I'd now just like to introduce our first presenter for today. Uh, and it's Mike Rosser. Mike is the owner of a family farming operation based at Ugara here in the Central West and also at Wenaring in the state's far northwest. He runs a predominantly grazing based operation with some dual purpose crops at Ugara and has extensive experience and knowledge in carbon, carbon trading. Uh, Mike, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks Rowan. Hi to everyone. Um, yeah, Rowan's probably pumped me up a little bit there. I, <laughs> I um, we um, our carbon projects um, were sort of done in back in 15 and 16 and, and moving forward we'll be moving more into soil carbon but um, our projects were were vegetation based um, and I'll just give a, a quick overview of of uh, what the country was before it the grazing management we we started on and then how that sort of helped us move into the to the um, the carbon based on the vegetation um, where uh, like Ryan said, we're, we're predominantly uh, sheep, Dorper sheep, um, running some cattle, got some, got some dingo issues out west there now that's um, forcing us sort of more to, to move to the cattle side of things. Um, we, we produce 
most of our lambs out west and at um, at Yugara, and then we finish finish them all down here at Yugara. We've got our own feedlot, and um, as Rowan said, predominantly we're we're fodder cropping, but we do produce cereals for our own feedlot. Um, we do run a few goats out west. Um, that number's been substantially reduced, not just because of the dry, but because um, it has helped us facilitate um, native forest regeneration within our projects. So um, we um, we feed a lot of animals down here, and that does help us relieve the pressure out west, which which does fit in with maintaining grout cover, which which certainly helps um, with our with our carbon projects. Um, we purchased um, Argyle out west, which is a 110,000 acre property just near Wenaring back in. Um, in 2004, um, and if Rowan, if you could show that next slide, please. It was a little bit um, um, dry when we were when we were. Oh, that's sorry. That's just where we where we are. Um, just as an indication, so you can see where we are in the state. And on the next run, Rowan, that was that was pretty indicative of the country that we that we purchased. There was a lot of channel country and flat out country on the on the place, but um, it's only really a benefit when we get um, flooding coming out of Queensland. Um, we sort of detected pretty early on that the country might need a little bit of rest from grazing. And um, to that end, we sort of started um, attending grazing courses, grazing management courses like the holistic management course and grazing for profit and the KLR courses as early as sort of 06, 07. Um, and then for, to facilitate rotational grazing management out there, we, we, uh, we ended up erecting about 250 kilometres of hinge joint on Argyle and probably 80 k's of polypipe with troughing and and tanks to try and spread the grazing pressure. We we fenced uh, 40 or 50 water points um, with trap yards so that we could trap goats out and trap livestock out, and that allowed us to to begin to um, look after our country a little bit better by by removing the goats which weren't um, very valuable at the time and lambs were a lot more valuable. Um, another picture there of, of country that. That's lighter, softer country that should be pretty well covered in grass, but um, a bit of previous uh, lack of management and and some seasonal conditions led it to be pretty bare. So um, we started we started um, rotating animals. I think the next one's a grazing chart, which most people are probably aware of now, but but pretty important to us back then to try and rotate. Um, oh, sorry, that's some channel country, pretty devoid of vegetation back then, um, and then a grazing chart where. Um, a lot of people were using them now. Most people should be using them. Um, not so many back then, but um, we were using it um, an RCS chart. But we we did our we did our ground truthing and monitoring um, the way that holistic management suggests. So so doing some visual observations on the ground and then moving our animals around based on our visual visual observations and and ground cover. So even back then, when we first started our rotational stuff, we were we were moving animal animals based on on ground cover and and pasture species and how they were grazed, rather than um, on on whether the sheep looked good or whether the the paddocks were just totally flogged out. So this is this is the same picture um, of the of that earlier lighter country in 2010 when we'd actually started getting some decent rain and and that's when we became very protective of our grass and rotating our animals around to to, to leave sufficient rest to allow the species to not only regenerate but spread and therefore and, and not end up <laughs> back like they were in those earlier photos and it was around it was around 08 that we first became aware of um, carbon sequestration and, and the potential benefits for it to be a source of income uh, to be to be brutally honest um, I'm not a greenie and I'm not not a greenie but the decision for us early on was made for financial reasons, and that's that's why we were looking at, um, at carbon sequestration. As I'll mention a bit later on, it actually, even though it was a financial side of it early on, um, the fact of being involved in the process has has, has increased the bottom line based on our on the improvements in our grazing business anyhow. But um, 08, the methodologies in 08 weren't really um, good enough the monitoring wasn't really quite there they weren't really practical for broad acre applications out west there so sort of fell away the, the carbon side of things until sort of 10 2012-13 um, when we became aware of some avoided deforestation projects that were emerging uh, i think rowan's got um, 
on the next the next slide, if you don't mind, Rowan. Um, that that's sorry, back to that's that same country, sort of five years later. So it, um, you know, we were we were pretty adamant that we didn't want to go back to those early photos where the the, the, the landscape was devoid of vegetation. So that grazing management and maintaining the ground cover has been pretty important all the way through. But um, on that next slide, Rowan, we come to the avoided deforestation. Apart part of this fencing infrastructure that we that we developed for our rotational grazing we started clearing some laneways and some holding paddocks and to do that we needed a property vegetation plan and we uh, we obtained one of those back in sort of 2007 um, and when this avoided deforestation methodology came out it was pretty much saying if you have got permission to clear trees and you do not clear them then you are continuing to sequester carbon and we'll pay you for it. So this came about in sort of 2012-13 when the methodology was made. Um, this was probably the lowest hanging fruit in regards to receiving money for, for carbon sequestration because um, the grazing doesn't really affect the avoided deforestation uh, methodology because it's, it's to do with mature age forests. So the fact though that we took the steps to change our grazing management and the infrastructure we needed to do that then led us to the property vegetation plan which led us to being eligible for the avoided deforestation methodology so that was the first part that we undertook um, the first carbon market we sold into was in 2015 for that project um, and i think the next photo rowan just shows an indication of of some of the country that um that we cleared um, that's country there that we cleared seeded with buffalo grass. Obviously, we don't do that anymore because we've, we've got to um, avoid a deforestation project over the whole property. But um, that's an indication of what we were doing. Um, and then, um, which is why we needed the PVP and which is why we were eligible for avoided deforestation. The next methodology that came about was a lot more um, relevant to what we were doing, um, which is the human induced regeneration. Um, of of native forest the definition of native forest is is any plant that can attain or has a potential to attain two meters of height and can attain or has the potential to attain 20 percent canopy cover so that's just not the mulga mulga trees that we've got um, around Wanaring, but a lot of the shrubbier plants like our uh, the woody weed plants like our um, hop bush and turpentine and punty bush so this is where our grazing management started proving very very positive and productive in the sense that we were already moving our animals based around on 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 triggers regarding um, ground cover and our grass species so we evolved into then moving our animals around before they were eating the native forest we make more money out of our animals eating grass than we do when we force them to eat shrubs so the infrastructure that we that we that we developed then led us to be eligible um, for the human induced regeneration because we'd taken steps to change our management which has induced the regeneration of of native forest um we we had a lot of changes still to make um obviously 250 kilometers of fencing doesn't happen overnight so we started getting into the carbon side of things during it um and it was it was compelled us to really finish off what we were trying to do because we could see that it not only benefited um, our grazing management uh, but also facilitated um, the development of a human induced regeneration project so um, we continued uh, both getting better at our grazing management getting better at feed budgeting getting better at um, identifying and um, promoting the growth of different plant species whilst um, allowing our native forest to regrow and, and therefore be able to be involved um, financially with carbon sequestration. So in our case, it's been, I know there's a little bit of bad press in Queensland about country being locked up and locked up for carbon projects and no grazing occurring. But in our case, um, it's been a pretty positive example of how you can, you can run a sustainable grazing enterprise um, and and also um, be part of a, a, a carbon project at the same time. We, due to our ability to control our animals with infrastructure and 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 grazing management, 
Um, we had the ability, if required, to destock if our animals were affecting the growth of native forest. We had the means to destock um, relatively quickly. Um, obviously, goats grazing and browsing on native native forest is, has a substantial impact on it for generations. So our infrastructure allowed us to continue to to get rid of a lot of goats. Um, there were other landholders out west there that um, part of their project development agreement was that they, they didn't run any small stock um, because they didn't really have the ability to stop um, hair, sheep and, and goats from affecting the rege regeneration uh, of native forests. So um, the infrastructure we'd put in really lent itself um, to us running a, a healthy regeneration project. Um, but like I say, I mean, the majority of our income now is still is still from from grazing, um, but and, and we looked at it more of a as a business opportunity. Um, you don't have to be either way on climate change or either way in environmental management if it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it's been good for our business financially, um, and that's why we why we we looked into it. Um, we. We, it gave us the it gave us the confidence because um, we're getting an income that's not so strongly linked to precipitation. Um, it gave us the confidence to buy buy farms elsewhere from Wanarang, which is when we came to Yagawa in in uh, in 2016, and then um, confidence again to buy more country in 2017, Paru Plains, which is north of Argyle. Um, the confidence to, to buy there and develop another project and and this is allowed we know we're employing six people now when it was only you know father and I early on um, we're running a lot more animals uh, it's been very very beneficial um, not just to our family but the families of our employees now um, so it's we didn't have to give up the grazing um, we still make most of our income out of out of animals, but it's allowed us to have the confidence to to sort of spread out a little bit and diversify geographically, which has been obviously very very handy um, for the dry times. We one of the biggest things in our grazing management, and that's uh, Rowan. You can cycle through those photos if you like, Rowan. That's just a bit more of an indication of the country that's that we've got out west. Um, the biggest thing for us has been the income generated from the carbon has allowed us to destock a lot earlier than we normally would. Um, we're, we're talking about project, I mean, Stuart will talk about um, soil carbon, which we haven't been involved yet and we would very much like to, but um, the greatest, and, and obviously grazing management will lead into, into soil carbon, but um, being able to destock animals early um, because we know that we've got some income coming from another source has allowed us to continually improve uh, the biodiversity of our pasture species because we're just not holding on too long <laughs> like we used to in the past because we're too afraid of selling animals and then not being able to buy them back in when it does rain, which has been pretty true over the last over the last 12 months. So we've ended up being able to get through droughts longer because we've run less animals, because we've been able to destock early. We're running our dorpers in an accelerated joining program. So every eight months we're joining them so we can run less animals, turn off more lambs than we did when we were running more animals um, and still receive our carbon income, which then allows us to destock earlier, look after our country better and then run more animals. So um, the carbon incomes really allowed us to improve even further our grazing management and, and increase the productivity of our grazing um, by giving us ways to graze better. I mean, if you could, if you could afford to run your farm with 50% of your stocking rate all the time, your farm would look amazing, you know. But and I'm not, and I'm not suggesting you need to do that whilst running it in conjunction with a project. But it gives you the flexibility to adjust your stocking rate and marry that with your, you know, your carrying capacity and your stocking rate together a bit, a bit more easily and um, without the stress. Of, um, of foregoing the income when you destock, especially in a in a prolonged dry like 2019. So that's sort of our story. I mean, I'm not I'm no expert on on carbon. I'm certainly not an expert on soil carbon, and I'm not even an expert on <laughs> on carbon sequestration through vegetation methods. But that's that's what we've done in our business, and it, and it's worked really well. There's there's probably four points 
um, I know um, we don't want to speak for too long, but there's probably four points that probably transcend um, the vegetation sequestration and, and moves into the soil carbon. And that's, for us, it was, um, what if the carbon isn't there? And um, what happened with us initially was that we, we developed a relationship with a company called Green Collar in Sydney. They, they were the ones that did the geospatial and the ground truthing to determine the amount of carbon that we could sequester and therefore sell. What set them apart for me, and I, and I, I, I don't work for them, but um, what set them apart for me was that they signed the carbon abatement contract. So the human induced regeneration is a 15 year project um, with a 10 year carbon abatement contract and a 100 year permanency of, of over, over the farm of that project. So Green Collar came to us and said, you've got this amount of carbon, but then they signed the carbon abatement contract with the government. So for me, that gave me the peace of mind to say, well, if they've misjudged or haven't told the truth about the amount of carbon there, then they are the ones left to fulfil the contract rather than me. So moving forward, and I'm not sure how the mechanism is going to work moving forward because the old mechanism that we were part of has just about run its course. But the first point would be to make sure that the amount of carbon that you think is there, be very, very careful as to who's told you that and then therefore what are the ramifications if you can't produce that carbon. The second, the second thing was, can I still run animals? I covered that a little bit. Uh, we've had some landholders out west that, that haven't been able to run the animals that they prefer to. Um, it's been okay in our situation, but I would suggest, and Stuart will know, but obviously building soil carbon is very, very hard if you don't have any ground cover. And part of keeping your ground cover is gonna be managing your country properly. So um, a big part of it will be attending grazing courses, I presume, and running grazing charts and making sure that um, your ground cover is as good as it can be, which is going to facilitate more soil carbon, and therefore determine how you do it with your infrastructure and your finances and, and however that that um, you are grazing it in the, the way that's going to facilitate um, the, the sequestration, sequestration of carbon, but it's going to be different for each farm and different for each landholder. Um, the third thing was, um, can I, what, you know, what if I want to sell the farm and it's got a project on it? Um, no one knows too much in our part of the world. There's been quite a few sales with a bit of carbon on it, but without seeing the project development agreement, I don't know what stipulations there are on the landholder. Um, Green Collar does have caveats on our titles. So um, when it comes to selling it, it's not just as simple as, as finding someone who wants to buy it and, and then selling it. Um, our bank uh, was unsure what values were going to be like after projects had finished. Values, valuers were uncertain as to what things were going to be worth and it's probably something worth investigating with whatever financial institution you're with as to how uh, it would affect um, the sale of your place if you'd like to and the effect on values. Like I say, these, a lot of these projects, we were in re relatively early um, so there hasn't, there's been a few sales, but um, probably not enough, and there probably hasn't been enough time elapsed since we started doing carbon projects to really see what the market thinks of, of, of properties with projects on them. Um, and the fourth point was moving once again into the financial part of the world. Even though our projects are 25 years, our carbon abatement contract's 10, um, and the permanency of the project's 100 years. So with regard to our avoided deforestation, if someone was to buy our place and the carbon contracts run out, they still can't clear it for 100 years. NAB has said to us that because they're not sure what the place is going to be worth after the carbon abatement contract finishes, they would like any, any money borrowed against a property with carbon on it to um, be totally amortised by the end of the carbon abatement contract. So if you've got a 10 year carbon abatement contract, they want us to pay any money back, interest and capital, everything, by the time that carbon abatement contract finishes, which is a pretty tall ask if you owe a fair bit of money. So if you're gonna get into carbon projects, it's probably worth talking with your bank and making sure that they aren't too jittery about, about carbon projects. NAB has gotten a lot better about it, uh, and I'm not having a go at them. They've been really good in facilitating us to expand, but um, I'm not sure what, what other banks are like, and that'd be up to, 
up to the borrower to sort of work out where their bank stands, but certainly something to think of. And the last thing is um, the ATO deems carbon credits to be off off farm income, which is which is ridiculous because if you're growing avocados or oranges, you're growing it on your farm, and it's <laughs> and it's 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 grown on your farm side of your farm. We're sequestering carbon by by regenerating native forest on our farm, and the tax office, um, I suppose, they want their money back as best they can, and they class as off farm income, which obviously means you can't average it over the five years, um, and it means that. I mean, Argyle, which we bought in 04, was in a partnership. Um, and by the time we were buying more country out there in 2017, we bought it under a company structure to obviously get the tax rate down to 27.5% rather than the individual tax rate that my father and I have to pay on, on the carbon we get from, from the first place. So if you're going to get into it, maybe you should talk to your accountant because um, there's a lot of things. I mean, had we, had we known a few of these things before we went into it, we, we may have bought ourselves out with a company at Argyle and then obviously paying a less of a tax rate. So um, although, in summary, although what we've done is probably a bit retrospective, uh, there's not many AD projects around anymore. There's probably not many human and judicial generation projects because you need scale, um, which means that sort of far Western country to be able to do it. But the four points that I've just outlined are probably pretty important for, for um, soil carbon as well. Obviously moving into the central west um, where there's not as much vegetation, soil carbon is going to be a bit more important. But the four points I've mentioned probably got a bit more to do with moving forward in any carbon project. Um, so that's that's about it. Those four points are pretty much the take home message from our family as to some things that probably need um, addressing before you before we should have made some changes with accountancy before we did things um, and you know by the time we lose half of our carbon <laughs> to the tax office and then another, another big wedge of it goes to debt reduction which is not a bad thing we're not losing the money it's it's, it's only reducing debt but um, in the end people say to me oh, it's all right for you you've got carbon income well we do but we can't always channel it to the areas of our business that we'd like to so that's about it, Ron. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Mike. The uh, the photos were were cracking of the just the stark difference and a bit of um, a bit of grazing management. And how quickly do you think that that change? I saw that you uh, bought the place in two thousand two. How quickly did you start seeing that that change in in management? Oh. Uh after every rain event, Rowan, we saw a bit of a change, but we just didn't have the ability to, to manage the country against the grazing pressure. Um, the place, most of the fencing had been done in the 50s. Um, it was all plain wire, a lot of it falling over. Um, we saw early on that we'd get rain events and then we'd, we'd have, you know, the goat pressure was the worst of it. You know, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't lock country up. We couldn't give stuff a chance to grow. And up until 2010, as everyone probably can remember, the, you know, it was pretty dry excuse me, through that decade and um, isolated rain events. But we saw we saw what we could do if we could lock a little bit of country up. And that's why we got into the rotational grazing stuff and, and did all the fencing so that we could really lock some stuff up. And But it, straight away, you see the difference. But you also you also see the difference of um, seeing it grow and then seeing it getting chewed away um, when you can't manage it. So, I mean, we all the grazing courses I went to, they, all they talked about was looking after your ground cover. And <laughs> I never had any, so I didn't know what I was supposed to be looking after. But um, once, once we, um, once we got that ground, we got really protective of our of our pasture because um, we we saw how quickly it could respond in answer to your question, but we also saw how quickly it could get devastated without the ability of of managing it. Yeah. Yeah, great answer. Thanks for that. Um, one of my favourite photos in that little slideshow is that I think you look like Bigfoot, where you're um, getting escaping out of the out of the photo with the uh, with the <laughs> in the grass there. So that um, that's my, that's my favourite photo in that. Uh, Narrowly, I will just pass over to you if there's um, if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, we'll, yeah, great. There, Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Rowan. That, um, that was a great presentation. Thanks for that, Mike. You have covered a lot of the questions I think that people had on their minds. There's one that came in, which I think maybe Rowan just in your last one was slightly answered around total grazing pressure. Um, but to extend to that, we're just wondering uh, what type of fencing we're using. Is, is that exclusion fencing or just go proof that you're talking about with total grazing pressure? Uh, only only seven line hinge joints, so seven ninety thirty. We um we've got a we run a barbed wire at the top, um, a salvage wire along the top of the hinge joint. Normally a belly wire and then and then a barbed wire on the bottom. I wish we had it on exclusion fencing to be honest. Um, with 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 the dog trouble we've got out there now, um, I'd like to do some exclusion fencing. The, the trouble we've got for us is that we're you know, around Charleville and up there where you're 500 mil rainfall, you're 12 grand a K for your exclusions, get better return on investment than Wenaring where it's <laughs> where it's 280 mil rainfall. But um, that fencing's good enough. That fencing's good enough. We do, It is interesting, even with the, the dog pressure, when we see dog tracks, we see a lot of it padding along a 790, 30 fence. Um, they don't seem to go through the fence as much um, as they as they do under. Um, so we're still receiving a little bit of control there, but um, no, just 790.30, definitely a barb on the bottom. Um, we find out there that the kangaroos start getting under and then it turns into a hole that goats make bigger and then sheep go through. So if we can keep that barb on the bottom, that's that's the biggest key to, to stopping the roos to start with. But um, yeah, I wish, <laughs> if I had my time again, I'd probably, probably do a bit of exclusion fence. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I think that's it from the audience. But I just just another question from me. Like you, you mentioned that you've now got the flexibility to to um, run less numbers and uh, of stock. Is that turnover less now? And at, but is the yeah basically is the is the is there has been a reduction in your total business turnover, or is it um, now that this carbon money is now making you $6 million, you don't have to worry about the, the livestock again? No, well, like I mentioned, I, 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 the majority of our business is, is still, is still comes from the livestock. But, I mean, and Stuart will talk about this, I'm sure, and anyone that's done a grazing course over the years knows that, you know, great, that good grazing and rest of, of animals promotes and would promote a lot more soil carbon and a lot more biodiversity than just locking stuff up and leaving it. So in our situation, yes, we we started out running less animals because we didn't want to we didn't want to mess up um, the carbon project to start with. But it's sort of it's sort of one build off the other. We ran less animals, um, but then because our country improved, we could still run more animals. They, we're probably running more animals than we used to, and still having a, a carbon project that's that's worthwhile because because we've been able to rest country at the right time. We've been able to destock when we should, um, which has improved the country, and therefore we can run more animals. So it's sort of we started doing that early on, but the carbon's really helped us lift it because it's just given that it's given us the confidence to destock earlier than what we normally would. Which the next dry time, which we Believe it or not, get quite a few at Winaring. The next try time, um, we last longer through it because our country's in better shape. So it's been a, I suppose, you know, you've got to look at it in, in a holistic way. The carbon's part of the business. If we left it up to the carbon, I don't think we'd have as good a landscape as what we do if we can really work hard to have the carbon supplement the grazing and then the grazing help improve the carbon. I think it's, the both have worked really well for us. Yeah, great. Uh, it's a great story, Mike, and um, and thanks for sharing. Um, I'll just hand over to our next speaker. Um, so, time for our next speaker. Stuart is the general manager uh, of Wilmot Cattle Company, based in the state's northern tablelands. Uh, Wilmot is a part of a beef breeding and trading enterprise, and has grazing management and innovation at the forefront of its business. They have recently secured a significant sale of soil carbon, which has been built up and stored on their properties through management changes they've implemented. I'll now, I'll now hand over to Stu. Uh, Thanks, Ron. Thank, 
Uh, Mike, that's a fantastic story, mate. Um, really enjoyed that. And it's one of the privileges of being able to be on these webinars is um, hearing other people's stories. Um, I just need to get the right screen set up here. Uh, yeah, the other exciting thing to me is um, basically what I'm about to talk about, uh, you've covered really well. and. Um, and all the same principles apply and, and you know in terms of grazing management principles uh the the exact same principles apply uh at ebor as they do at uh when airing in 1200 mil rainfall climate and a 300 mil rainfall climate so um that's what i think is a real uh positive story to tell and um the other part of it uh is your emphasis there on you know carbon being an additional revenue stream and a co-benefit of of your production system and and that it hasn't um negated your, your you know your production business in any way uh in fact it's only enhanced it so it's crazy about the ato considering off farm income um need to find a way to get around that ron can you just tell me how do i uh just get rid of the video of myself so i can see my screen so just below the mute button, you'll see the uh, little camera button. Uh, now I'm just looking at Mike. <laughs> I just need to minimise that, uh, or maybe I'll throw it over here. There we go, that might be better. But right, uh, you can see my slideshow there now. Yep, yep, all good. So basically, um, there's a few things I'm going to rattle through today, and I will go through these a little bit quicker. Mike's had a really great scene there in terms of um, uh, the grazing management stuff that I was about to talk about, but in terms of, uh, I'll just briefly go through who we are, um, how we built soil carbon in our soils, why we focus on it, um, the recent deal that we've done, and also elaborating a bit on the ERF um, opportunities there that Mike uh, alluded to in with regard to um, AD and HIR. I'll talk about soil carbon. So, um, who we are and where we're from. Uh, these are our three properties. So I live up here at, at um, Ebor on our place called Wilmot. It's about four and a half thousand acres, um, 1200 mil rainfall, volcanic basalt soils. It's a bloody spectacular farm and we feel so privileged to live here. Uh, we've got 6,000 acres at Woodburn uh, at, down between Armidale and, and Walker. Um, that's more of a granite soil type, a um, bit over 700 mil rainfall and more uh, native grass, more breeding country. And then we just bought 4,000 acres out of, um, at Canada, a place called Morocco. Um, and it is a mix of, of sort of some really heavy black soil to a red basalt and then some grey lime country there as well. Um, and lower rainfall. Uh, and, you know, as I said a minute ago, the, we're basically implementing exactly the same principles at Wilmot in 1,200 mil rainfall climate as we are at Morocco in a 600 mil climate, uh, as Mike is in a 300 mil rainfall climate. So. Um, very much going to, to I suppose, uh, emphasise a lot of Mike's point um, in terms of how we've regenerated our, these landscapes. Uh, that's out my front. We see every couple of months as our main mob comes past, um, and and that's basically using uh, a small number of large mobs, small area for a very short period of time, uh, at fairly high density, and, and not coming back to that area in, until it's had sufficient rest that it's ready to be raised again. Uh, rest period um, fluctuates considerably through the year. Um, so we talk about uh, regen ag, and this is can be a polarizing term, um, but effectively, you know, when we think about it, we're, it, we're talking about uh, managing to a set of principles, not practices, uh, and using animals to restore a landscape and its biodiversity uh, at a very low cost, as opposed to using inputs and very much as Mike just described there, that animals are a critical part of landscape restoration and, and um, uh, rather than the lock it and leave it approach. Um, and one of these, this is a quote that I love from Gabe Brown. Um, it's one of the first things I heard about Regen Ag was, uh, you know, accepting or acknowledging that we have um, caused some land degradation across our landscapes over the last 60 years. Uh, and we actually need to take a bit of responsibility for that. Um, and so, you know, he says, why do we want to talk about sustainable agriculture and sustaining a degraded resource? We need to be talking about regenerating uh, our soils and uh, and our, our whole ecosystems, our whole landscape. So um, when I think about region ag, that's what I think about. I don't um, consider it in a polarising fashion. I really don't uh, set out to, to make it a divisive conversation in, um, in any way. So. Um, 
so basically what we do on farm and how we do what we do, we uh, we focus on a set of principles and, and these are the soil health principles coming out of the RCS Grazing for Profit School. Um, I would, you know, urge anyone who's considering um, improving landscape management uh, to undertake that course as the best foundation for uh, this system of management um, and, and whole of business management and people management. Um, it's much more than just a grazing school. So, um, these principles are, you know, they've sort of been broadly um, agreed upon uh, by a few different um, organisations around the world, and this is RCS's take on them. But effectively, we're everything is about planning and monitoring and managing. So we're we're constantly planning what we're doing ahead of time, going back, monitoring how our landscapes responding, uh, and then making changes and managing that plan as and when we need to. Um, maximising living plant production, so we're focused on all plants uh, having opportunities to grow. We don't. Um, spray weeds or, uh, or or consider that we have weeds. Yes, we have blackberries and we pulled out some fireweed today. They're obviously noxious weeds that we do manage, but things like flea bane and scott thistles, there, they all have a role to play in ecosystem um, restoration. Uh, and it's been really exciting to see that out at Morocco where, um, you know, we've been doing some pasture improvement, but we've been letting the weeds um, play their part and I suppose play their role in, the, in that landscape. Um, Evolution and it's exciting to see we've done plenty of trials out there and it's exciting to see the difference in you know where we've managed weeds and where we haven't um, So accepting that all, all, all plants have a role to play we focus very much on soil biology as opposed to um, Physics and chemistry all our soil test analysis is all that we do every year is obviously a chemical analysis um, But what we're most focused on is a biological activity within our soils how much fungi we've got in there how much how many earthworms have we got you know, how many worm castings can we see? Um, what sort of indicators of, of that microbiology really working in our soil? Um, that's what we're looking for. Uh, our goal is, you know, we're, we're looking at every opportunity to introduce biodiversity and, and absolutely moving away from any form of monocultures. So um, even in some uh, wheat cropping that we're doing at Morocco, um, it's a, it's a short-term uh, thing as we're um, restoring that landscape, I suppose. But even when we're putting wheat in the ground, we're putting peas and vetch uh, in there with it so that we're creating um, some level of diversity. Uh, in any of our forage country out there, we're not, we don't bother about managing weeds. It's a multi-species forage um, with annuals and perennials mixed through it. Uh, and although, you know, we have some weed burdens, but, but nothing too significant that really affects our production. Uh, Mike talked a lot about ground cover and we're, we're very much the same. That's um, absolutely key to uh, restoring our landscapes and um, you know it's been terrific to see such fantastic seasons behind us in the last 18 months and an opportunity to, for people to grow biomass and, and potentially lay down ground cover and um, what we really need to make sure we focus on is making sure we don't lose all that ground cover again because it's, you know it's the one thing that we need more than anything. Uh, and again, talking about lowest block as nature's recyclers, um, as Mike talked about, you know, they're a critical part of our landscape management. Um, if I talk about our grazing principles, uh, you'll notice some um, similarities here in terms of planning, monitoring, and managing. Um, that's the, we're doing that all the time. We're writing grazing plans, looking forward to looking backwards at, at you know how our grazing is going, whether we're undergrazing or overgrazing, and, and then adjusting that plan to suit. Uh, we're constantly adjusting our rest period to, to um, suit the growth rate of the plant. And we do that by adjusting our stocking rate um, to match our counting capacity. So if our growth is slowing down, then we're making um, destocking decisions. If our growth is increasing, um, then our rest period is getting shorter and we're increasing our stocking rate. Uh, so these are in order of importance. Um, managing livestock effectively, so we're making sure that we've got uh, sufficient feed in front of animals all the time, a really good water supply, and that fundamentally their um, psychology is sound and that they're in a good frame of mind. Um, and so that low stock handling, when we're operating at fairly high density here now, um, particularly at Wilmot, um, their their psychology is absolutely paramount to ensuring uh, continued good production. Um, stock density, maximising stock density for a minimum amount of time. Again, these are uh, very much in order of importance. So we make sure we've got those first four right before we look at increasing our stock density. But it's an extremely powerful tool for um, regenerating landscapes and, and improving biodiversity and growing more biomass and increasing ground cover uh, and, and improve production in animals. So um, we do use stock density as a pretty powerful tool to do that. Uh, and that last point there about biodiversity using uh, you know, diversity of plants and animals to improve ecosystems. So we've planted a lot of trees here. Um, there's been you know, 
50 something species of trees that we've planted here over the last few years. Um, and we're, we're looking at, you know, all forms of diversity in terms of um, plants and animals that we can bring to the landscape uh, as and where we can. Um, just gonna get that out of the way, there we go. So uh, decision making, my grazing, I just wanna talk about my here. Um, Mike talked about grazing charts and what my grazing have done is take that grazing chart to uh, the next level basically. Um, and it's our now our single most powerful um, decision making tool uh, in this business. We make $100,000, $500,000 decisions based off the information that, that Maya is generating for us um, every day of the week, very well, every week, every month. Um, we're making really significant decisions for you know software that costs us 200 bucks a month. So I've, you know the cost of, of that tool is is completely insignificant to the value of the decisions that we make from it. Uh, it effectively um, enables us to manage our grass inventory, our livestock inventory at a mob-based level, uh, continue to monitor our rest period and see whether we're, you know, when we plan our grazes, uh, is our rest period getting shorter because we've got too many animals and not enough feed? Is it getting longer than we would like? So we haven't got enough animals and, and we've got more feed than, than we have animals. So we're able to continually monitor that rest period. Uh, we make short-term graze plans in there, so sort of out to six weeks or, or a couple of months at a time. At this time of year, we're now moving into our non-growing season, so we'll get in there and make a, uh, a non-growing season plan that's you know three or four months long to get us through to spring. Um, and then we're making long-term stocking rate decisions based off that information and, and forecasting. So we're about to start writing our budget. And the first place we go when we start to write our budget is into my where we will forecast rainfall and um, stocking rate over the next 12 months, and that will determine how many animals we turn over. Um, I should have mentioned there earlier, we are, we are largely a trading uh, business. We turn over between four and 5,000 animals a year. Um, we have a 1,000 cow breeding herd between Wilmot, uh, predominantly Woodburn, and also some here at Wilmot. Um, and we've actually got a few sheep on at the moment out of Morocco. So the trade cattle uh, is our predominant enterprise, um, but we do have a 1,000 cows as well um, within our inventory. So, um, the other part about my is that as a component of the region network deal that I'm about to start talking about, uh, it was a it was a critical um, part of that. Uh, I don't think we could have done that deal. In fact, we couldn't have done that deal had we not been using my grazing to capture all that grazing management data. Um, so that was a database of grazing management data that we included in that um, methodology. And the second point there, um, it was a tool through which we were able to demonstrate uh, the practice change that we've implemented. And I'm about to start talking about practice change a bit more. Um, it is absolutely uh, a core component of any carbon soil carbon project is you have to demonstrate practice change. And so through using my, we're able to demonstrate that yes, we are shifting animals quite frequently, um, you know, adhering to longer rest periods, um, growing more biomass, and that's how we're sequestering more soil carbon. Uh, so to get onto carbon, um, I'm rattling along here. Hopefully I'm rattling along quick enough. Um, we absolutely consider it as a co-benefit of our beef production system. Um, and and to this next slide, where uh, we are a beef production business first and foremost, and as Mike was explaining, you know, he's very much the same. Their their business is in livestock production, um, but uh, you know they're they're adding um, additional revenue streams through carbon as a co-benefit, and that's how we consider it. So. We don't claim to be carbon farmers. We don't, um, you know, our, our guys get out of bed every day and, and make decisions based off um, how much rain we've had, how much grass we've got and how many cattle we've got and how much uh, revenue we're generating from those animals. Um, and through doing that and through focusing on grazing management uh, and data collection um, uh, to, uh, you know, analyze our grazing management business and our production business, um, we've been able to sequester fairly significant amounts of, of soil carbon. Um, data is absolutely a great, we could not have done the uh, the deal that we did had we not had the data that we've got. Um, and so, you know, people really need to consider um, you can't manage what you don't measure. And that's how we, uh, that's a real core value within this business is that data is critical for us to be able to continue to analyse our um, performance uh, in our business from a grazing management optimisation, um, beef production, uh, financial profitability. We've got to have data to be able to determine whether we're you know, positive or negative and all those things. Um, we manage risk in this business. So one of our core things is to continually challenge our overheads and, and try to, um, you know, manage our overheads as best we can. So because 
to me, overheads are at risk, and so the, the less um, our overheads and larger the inputs, the more we can reduce them, uh, the, the less risk we have in our business. So we're using animals, not inputs, to um, restore this landscape. Uh, and through doing that, we've built a lot of resilience to climate extremes in our landscape. So the point here being that we believe in an enlightened approach to, to grazing management and fundamentally how, we, um, how that benefits our soil will lead to uh, significant amounts of, um, or significant increase in soil organic carbon levels um, at a national level. Uh, and there is a massive opportunity here for landholders to monetize that carbon uh, as an additional revenue stream. Um, so, there's a, uh, so what have we done here? Uh, this is um, Wilmot's soil test data over the last 10 years. Uh, you can see each of those lines is a, is a soil test site. Um, that red dashed line is the average of all of them over time. These yellow dots are uh, rainfall um, each year, and so that yellow line is declining rainfall over time, and this red line is increasing soil organic carbon over time. Um, the interesting thing here, oh, went the wrong way there, um, uh, in 2019, this place was getting dry, you know, relative to um, historical average, I suppose, so we were getting the some fairly significantly dry periods. You know, the last six months of 2019 were, were pretty ordinary here. September 2019, um, half this place was burnt. Uh, and, and at that point where that drought arrow there is, that was when those soil tests were taken was in May. So we're at 4.69% um, in 2019. Went into six months of very dry, uh, a fire burning half the farm. And then January, um, February, March, we had bucket loads of rain. Uh, and we soil tested again in May 2020, and our soil carbon levels had um, you know, remained basically unchanged. We were still around that 4.6, 4.7% soil organic carbon. So that really um, affirmed for us, I suppose, that we have built a, a level of resilience into the landscape here. Um, and the theory that droughts and fires will volatilise carbon, we've got a one you know, point in time, I suppose, to suggest that that um, isn't necessarily the case. Um, so on to what we have done. Uh, we worked with Impact Ag and, and basically um, three years ago, Toby Dragon started working with Impact Ag and we gave him our soil test data and sent him to, um, you know, around Australia and around the US looking for an opportunity for us to monetize our soil carbon. Uh, was there any other opportunity other than the um, ERF model? So came across this organisation called the Regen Network, who were looking at monetising soil carbon using blockchain. Uh, and we effectively worked with them for two years to develop a method um, to create a what we call the Carbon Plus Grasslands Credit, or they are called. So this is a private market transaction. Uh, we used a combination of our on-ground samples as ground truth points um, overlaid with remote sensing uh, to determine our carbon levels across the farm and the change over time. Um, we also the carbon, the plus part of the carbon plus is that we included the sustainable development goals of, of ecosystem health, soil health and animal welfare. Um, and we used a whole bunch of data to verify that we were improving those three metrics across the farm as well. Um, so that this, this credit was more than just soil carbon. There was, there was you know, additional benefits going with that. Um, our soil samples, uh, they were taken at the same sites at the same time of year, um, every year down to 15 centimetres across each farm um, year in, year out for the last 10 years. Uh, and that consistency of data set was, was a real critical thing that it was repeatable um, and consistent over time. Uh, they then calculated methane emissions per farm using the University of Melbourne calculator and also a um, greenhouse gas emissions calculator out of uh, South America, I think, to calculate our emissions. And then they were discounted from our total um, soil sequestration that they had uh, concluded with sequestered. So over that three year period, uh, between Wilmot and Woodburn, we'd sequestered um, over a bit over 50,000, it was like 55,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, but uh, most of these methods, they're all discounted for inaccuracy, so it was discounted by 25%, and we only marketed 43,000 tonnes of CO2E. Um, so it was discounted by 25%. We netted about half a million dollars over those three years, which equated to 62 bucks hectare per annum um, per year. Um, every, interestingly, you know, Mike was talking a lot about veg. Uh, interestingly, the um, 
every tree was excluded from the project area. This is the same under the RF model for soil carbon is that um, trees are basically excluded from uh, soil carbon um, project areas. So the, the project area went from 4,200 hectares back to about 2,700 hectares. Um, but effectively, if you divide the uh, tons of CO2e by 3.67, you'll get how many tons of carbon we have sequestered in our soil, just under 12,000 tons or 4.4 tons per hectare. Um, so a fairly significant shift there. Uh, that was a private market transaction. Um, that's what we've been paid for over the last three years. And one of the reasons we did that is, we, is that we were gonna be able to be paid for carbon that we had sequestered retrospectively. Um, uh, so, so one of the reasons we pursued that. Um, I'm now gonna explain around a, an ERF soil carbon project and how you could potentially participate in this. Um, uh, if you didn't have any data that you could potentially put through a regen network model. So um, the way I look at it, there's about seven steps to an ERF soil carbon project. Um, you need to consider that you're signing a contract with the federal government, so this is extremely uh, onerous. Um, uh, there's a, a fairly high administrative burden. Um, it's very expensive, it's very rigorous, um, because I want to make sure every I is dotted and P is crossed. Uh, it would be a very good idea to engage a project developer. So um, Mike talked about Green Collar, uh, Carbon Linker One, who have been working away at soil carbon for the best part of the last 15 years and um, who we have used and would recommend. Um, without trying to create too much confusion here, we have baselined all three farms. Before we sold the region network credit, we weren't sure if that was gonna be a saleable credit. Uh, so we baselined all three farms, assuming that if we didn't sell the regen credit, then we would want to make sure that we're in a position to be able to capture any carbon gains from here forward. We now will remove Wilmot Woodburn uh, from the ERF project um, because we've sold carbon off this farm and, it's, and there's a permanent 25 year permanency period. Um, but Morocco uh, is still under this ERF soil carbon project. Um, so we registered our project, Took about six months to get through all the paperwork and and accrual, you know, collate all the data that we needed historically. They wanted 10 years of data. You need to write a land management strategy that someone else needs to write. It can't be the project developer and it can't be you, it needs to be a third party. And so you need to find a consultant to write that for you. And not many of them know what a land management strategy is. Um, then you have baseline. Uh, this is extremely um, intensive across all three farms. We took one meter samples, it was about 150 samples per farm cost us about $160,000 um, to baseline. Uh, the, then, the project is then considered implemented from the point of baselining um, and you need to demonstrate that a practice change has been undertaken. So that can be intensification of grazing like Mike and I have both talked about. It could be multi-species pastures, it could be using lime and gypsum as opposed to synthetic birth uh, or compost or, or uh, and there's a, you know, there's a short list of other things that you can do, but you have to demonstrate uh, implementation of a practice change that can't be something that you've done previously. You're then resampling five years or 10 years um, to determine uh, what change you have accrued in your soil organic carbon levels. That's all ordered by a third party uh, and you now have some ACUs to, to sell or potentially have some ACUs to sell um, on the open market. Uh, there's some pros and cons there. I won't get stuck into them. I'm using up a bit of time here, um, but it, it is expensive and it's onerous, um, but it, there is an opportunity there for people to um, uh, monetize so what they will, you know, should be fairly significant gains if they implement um, a significant practice change. Uh, the three key take home messages, I suppose, here just to emphasize on, on Mike's point, really, uh, I would encourage everyone to focus on a continuous improvement of grazing management. A grazing for profit school is a great place to start. Um, so look at ways to increase your density and diversity. Uh, through you know the implementation of those grazing management principles and from that will flow um, enormous abundance and, and thus opportunity. Data is absolutely critical. Uh, you can't measure what you don't measure. And so in order for you to be paid for carbon, you need to know how much you have. Um, so the best first step would be to go and take some soil samples yourself uh, and find out what, you know, what carbon levels you've got. If you've got taken samples in the past, go back to those same sites and then consider what's changed in the, from the last soil test to this soil test in terms of management and so how has that affected your carbon levels? Have they gone up or down? And, and if so, how, why so? Uh, and lastly, um, you know, consider natural capital as a co-benefit opportunity to generate additional revenue. Um, because as Mike's explained, and I think as we're demonstrating, um, there's a real opportunity here for, for landholders are not only in a grazing management system, but also in a, um, in a cropping based system as well. 
Um, so that's me. I'll leave you with that quote. Uh, you know, we we don't um, inherit this earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children, and I think about that every day. About you know the landscape. I want to um, enable our kids to be able to manage. So um, thank you, Mark. Uh, so, thanks, Rowan. Uh, thanks, thank you, Stuart. Um, that was great. Uh, I really like the. It seems that both you and Mike would, would have used um, used consultants and and those sorts of things because it seems that you guys are, are farmers. Um, you don't you don't buy a dog and, and bark yourself. So I think it's it's really good that you've used consultants to to go out and find these opportunities that. Uh, would either take yourselves hours and hours, um, days to find, or um, and you've you've handed that on to someone else. Is that is that something that you'd recommend to both of you? Yeah, for sure. Don't try and do this alone. Um, you know, there are specialty businesses. There's only a handful in Australia because this is such a new and emerging market. There's been a lot more activity uh, in the space that Mike's been talking about in terms of veg and. Um, and Savannah burning and so forth, and that's where those guys have been playing. Uh, there's very few that know much about soil carbon, um, but they are emerging more and more as we learn more and more about it. Yeah. Um, now I am aware that we've just gone over it. We um, of time. We do have a few questions, so if uh, feel free to drop off if um, if you if you finish there. We do have uh, a survey at the end, but Nerily, I'll just pass over to you to. Um, answer, uh, ask these couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rowan. And thanks, Stuart. Again, that was a really great presentation, answered some really important questions that I think uh, those that have tuned in are really keen to hear about. I did have one that's come in. Um, in a few cases, increased rainfall years have decreased carbon. Uh, this person's just asking you to shed a bit of light. Um, it might be worthwhile going back to your slides if possible. I think it refers to the to the graphs you had earlier, Stuart? Uh, yeah, that's uh, an interesting point. Um, I'd have to think pretty hard about, uh, hang on, if you'd like me to put it up there, I can if you like. Um, oh, lost it. Um, Can you guys see that there now? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's probably a fair assumption to make there. Um, probably only one year there where uh, our carbon came off a bit. Um, but if I go 16, 17, it was it was only a very small amount there. Basically, it was held around that five percent. Um, you know, it's probably more this where, where that trend really dropped off, our rainfall really dropped off and we're able to sustain or, or slightly increase those carbon levels again. Um, I can't think of, like I got here in 2016, um, yeah, I, I can't think of why that would be. We're about to soil test again this month and I suspect we'll be back over 5%, you know, based on the season we've had and the, and the biomass we've grown. Um, I'm assuming in that top 15 tenemas, we should be back over 5 yeah, I, I really like that um, that graph there, Stu. It just sort of shows that the fluctuations that can happen from season to season, um, and how variable soil carbon can be. But uh, it's a, it's a long term thing, and and the trend is what's important. Yeah, and and a really critical point here. That's the top fifteen centimetres. We are focused on building deep rooted perennial pastures, uh, and you know. What we, what no one knows, and I, I was at a forum in Canberra last week where, um, you know, there was a hundred of the best soil scientists in Australia. No one was talking about carbon at depth, and um, we have now baseline, and we're we're just waiting on those results. Um, but it's at depth is where the real opportunity is for for us to build carbon. So that top fifteen centimetres should remain pretty stable. Yeah. Really was there. So Rowan. Sorry, just one more question if we've got uh, time. Uh, Anne's just asked, how long did it take you to build the data into the MyGrazing program to start making some good decisions with that information? Um, if you've got 12 months of uh, stocking rate data, basically animal numbers um, and rainfall, that's a really good start. Um, 
I don't think I'll be quite get onto it here quick enough, but there's an analy the, the analytics chart on my is is basically a um, uh, an overall summary of the grazing chart that Mike um, displayed, and that that shows our stocking rate relative to our, to our counting capacity um, and our rolling rainfall. Uh, and so that chart is is the most valuable part on what we make big decisions based off. So if you've got 12 months of data, you know then you've got a, you can generate a 12 month um, start a 12 month rolling point from there, rolling stocking rate and rolling rainfall point from there. So um, basically it's, you know, number of animals on farm uh, and it can be as simple as at the end of each month, how many animals did you have and what was their LSE rating uh, or DSE rating, sorry, so, um, and what was your monthly rainfall? Um, just that, that, that's enough data to get going for a start. Yep. Great, thanks oh, yeah. for that. And Ron, at this stage, that's um, the only questions that we have. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so that's all the time we have today. I'd just like to uh, thank Stu and Mike again. Um, yeah, really great presentations. They hit all the points that we that we at the Central West uh, LLS here want want to to pass on to producers. So I just really appreciate your. Um, your time on this. Uh, I'll just keep going with a couple more slides. Just a, a quick plug on some more events coming up. Um, I've put the registration link in the chat box uh, for our third and final webinar for the uh, soil carbon for your farm business. Um, there's, we've also got another uh, webinar happening tomorrow with Dr. Belinda Hackney talking about pastures. Um, please just go to the LLS website to find the links for that. And finally, we've got some uh, winter pasture workshops coming up. Just going to go through the fundamentals, measuring ground cover and, and dry matter cuts, feed budgeting, those sorts of things there at, uh, at Trundle and Yugara. Um, and that's that's it, that wraps things up. If you'd like anything, uh, any further questions, don't hesitate to give me a, a ring or an email. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks all for your time. Cheers, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, All cheers, right, Ron. Thank you. Farewell.